Good morning or good afternoon. It's Matt Coleman, the co-founder of Magnify World. We've got a very distinguished guest today. He's been in the visual effects industry and he's the president of the Motion Capture Society, amongst other things. Demian, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? In fact, great. In fact, it's D-Man, right? Isn't that your nickname in the industry? Yeah, D-Man, it's a lot easier to spell than Damien. So <laughs> how did you get that? Um, <clears throat> I think it, I went to Seagraph one year and my boss just abbreviated my name on my name tag and I thought it was cool. So ever since <laughs> then, stuck. I've just been going by D-Man. Yeah, it's stuck. Excellent. So look, we've been talking about your career and I'd like to take you back to the EA days you were telling me about earlier and how you progressed in motion capture and, and everything else. Could you give us a bit of a background on yourself? Um, sure, I started off, uh, I'm a long time sort of computer hacker from way back in the day. And uh, I used to play with computers all through my life. And then uh, I ended up getting a, a job at Electronic Arts um, actually testing video games of all things as the foot in the door. There's a lot of people who kind of get into the game tester route. And I was there for a few months and then the motion capture opportunity came up open and I had previously worked in the film industry. So um, because of my film industry background and my uh, game and uh, computer experience, I got the job as the motion capture guy at Electronic Arts. And uh, we built um, one of the biggest motion capture studios in the world and it's still one of the biggest studios in the world. And then I left um, Electronic Arts to come to Hollywood and I did uh, Matrix, the Matrix sequels. Um, and then I went to work for Sony Pictures for a long time and did all of the sort of groundbreaking virtual production movies that sort of led to where we are kind of today. So I did uh, Polar Express, Monster House, Beowulf, I Am Legend, Watchmen, uh, Alice in Wonderland, Oz the Great and Powerful, Amazing Spider-Man, and everybody's favorite, Green Lantern. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So I know we're going to talk about the, the future of virtual production later, but tell me, you know, where, where did it really start? And some, some people do say it started 25 years ago or longer, but, you know, can you give us the journey of virtual production and... and yeah, start from the start from the beginning. Um, <clears throat> well, I feel like virtual. Produ I mean, for me, virtual production is is a, is a sort of a broad term. It it starts with camera digitization, some sort of real time rendering of that digitization, and then a way to visualize that. So, we didn't really have the ability to digitize the camera and. Re, you know, represent that in real time until right around the Polar Express time. And at that time, we were not using the technology on stage, but we would shoot the motion capture sort of in a black box kind of cameraless setting. So we were focusing on performance and then we would assemble it all and then give that to uh, Robert Zemeckis. And he would then do what you would now consider to be the virtual production process. Uh, we called it like the director's layout room or something. So he would have a real time uh, scene of, you know, Tom Hanks and company running around uh, pretending to be kids on the train. And he could then play that back in real time, take his virtual camera that he was getting captured and figure out all his angles and everything. And that was essentially how he shot uh, that movie. And what Monster that, House. Way? Um, we did that in about two, 2000, 2001 ish, right, right, right there. Okay. <clears throat> so that was the first time when we'd be able to have sort of real time camera capture with the scenes put together and the director being able to explore those scenes uh, without the direct, you know, the actors being there. So that process was sort of on polar and we did it throughout uh, the rest of our movies. <clears throat> and then as the technology got better and better, and other people started to uh, come into the sort of the, the, the realm of doing real-time CG in filmmaking. Um, Avatar, uh, James Cameron, he really didn't want to wait through to that second stage. He wanted to be doing it live uh, while he was shooting. So that uh, director's thing was moved 
to the first sort of pass of shooting. Um, so then Avatar really sort of iterated on that. And the people who worked on Avatar then went off to do Real Steel. And that's where I feel like the, the pieces all started to come together. So everything was sort of like pieces. You know, we we're touching on the things that you would consider to be modern virtual production now. Um, and doing it in different pieces or different parts of the pr production pipeline. But Real Steel, I think, was the first one that really kind of did the full circle. You know, they started off by visualizing the whole movie with motion capture, capturing the camera, uh, putting together an entire previs of the whole movie, figuring things out like how many extras they would need and when the child actor needed to be on set and, and what they were going to do during their night shoots from photogrammetry scans. So they sent out survey teams that would do these like virtual bubbles. Um, and then they would make decisions in that virtual bubble, uh, keeping the virtual camera locked to real world constraints. And the cool thing about what they were doing is when they went back to shoot it again, they held themselves to that. They, they, they colored within the lines of the thing that they'd figured out in virtual production. It wasn't just, like a previous pass that you then threw out and then did something totally different. They actually shot the movie they wanted to make first. And then when they were all figured out, they went back and got the film plates that made that make sense. And they tracked the camera again and they lined everything up and they could get it within like a few centimeters of where they'd figured out in the virtual world on the actual set. And they supposedly saved themselves like $25 million and did the shoot in half the time. and. You know, they were doing nights and with children and things that are typically very hard to do, but it was just very efficient. <clears throat> and then <clears throat> that team from Real Steel, like the same people who keep working in these virtual production movies tend to move as kind of a unit. You know, they, they know what to do now. So um, that same team would roll on to another uh, a movie like I think, you know, uh, Marwin was another movie that some of those people went to do. <clears throat> And Weto did Avatar, of course, and they've been sort of, um, they're an interesting company because, you know, they, they're they relatively young. You know, they were kind of formed to make the, the Lord of the Rings movies or thereabouts. And um, they're kind of old now, but I mean, as, as visual effects companies go, they didn't have a lot of stuff grandfathered in that they couldn't change. So their whole company is built around basically virtual production from the ground up. Whereas other people are kind of shoehorning it in as like a, a thing that now they have to do. Weta was sort of evolved with this process, has, has evolved that process. So they're really kind of fighting the, the front lines of, of, of innovation when it comes to virtual production. But that's sort of where it's been and where we're going. Now we've got the new Avatar movies. Um, now we've got uh, COVID speeding up the people's desire to do this, to work virtually. Even people that weren't going to work virtually now want to work virtually because they can't work any other way. So <clears throat> the advent of real-time rendering has really accelerated uh, virtual production and uh, also the ways that you can view it, so, you know, because we've got camera digitization, we've got real-time rendering, and then some sort of viewing thing. Uh, what is that? Well, now it could be a uh, giant LED wall or um, VR headset or your iPad tablet. You know, it's just the, whatever the device is that makes the most sense for you, you can now kind of project yourself into that virtual environment as if you were there. It's like our version of the holodeck. Yeah, if you look at what, you know, uh, Lion King, uh, how they produce that in using VR headsets to craft every perfect shot, I mean, although it's photorealistic and and one of the the probably could be the best one that they say that's out there in the recent couple of years. I mean, what are your thoughts on the quality and and can it get better? Um, and is did VR play a really big role in regards to telling that story? Um, well, I didn't work on that one, but um, the interesting thing I know about that is they they did a lot of um, motion capture of things that you might not like normally consider motion capturing. So they would get like a dolly pusher guy who, you know, on a film set would be pushing a little cart down a track. And they had that guy push a cart through their studio, but they put markers on the cart. 
And so the guy got to do his regular film job and felt like he was not doing virtually anything. He was doing a physical, practical thing, but they digitized it in a way that made it into the computer just like he'd been there on set. So you've got this very analog feel to these digital assets, like the camera, they, they captured a drone inside of a warehouse. They had, you know, tripods with markers on them and dollies. And so they were kind of digitizing the imperfections of the analog world and putting it into this digital world and kind of making it seem a little less digital because sometimes digital things can be too perfect. We're not used to seeing that much perfection. So you got to kind of figure out how to mess it up a little. And um, real-time motion capture uh, lets you do that a little bit. And then being able to put on a VR headset and then stand in that location as if you're actually there is incredibly informative. You know, how tall is that tree? Well, let me go stand next to it. Oh, it's really big. You know, on the computer, it was tiny. Um, and, and that's uh, very useful for decision-making. Um, it can be like, you're actually there, but you're not all in the same room. You know, we could stand next to one another and point at things and walk around stuff, but you're at your house and I'm at my house and we don't need to be in the same room. So VR is starting to allow people to go to these virtual locations anytime they want, which is pretty cool. Like Ready Player One, I was just watching some behind the scenes of Spielberg and he was just like, on the floor with his Vive headset and his two things and he's figuring out camera angles and everybody else is just standing around while he's noodling in this awesome way that, you know, he can find the perfect angle. And, and, and I know that uh, more and more they're uh, becoming comfortable with the technology. So you'll see people like who were, you know, didn't know how to get their own email in a Vive headset doing all these virtual things. And, you know, two years, three years ago, they would have poo-pooed working in that way. And now they can't live without it. So it's, it's really neat to see people sort of jumping in and splashing around in the deep end and enjoying themselves. And, and what are the, some of the advantages of using um, Unity or the Unreal Engine and the gaming engine tech into creating these virtual environments? And be, be, can you tell us how you can manipulate you know, the virtual backgrounds and, and potentially you said it can save money, right? So it's a good move. Um, there's less expense, uh, less manpower in post-production in particular because you're shooting in real time. But can you talk us about how the gaming engine works um, with the creation of that and how the directors and everybody is using them? Well, sure. So uh, game engines are uh, real-time rendering CG environments that are used to make games, typically. And, um, you know, they can have, you know, 65 players running around in real-time shooting each other, whatever the game uh, requires. So the sheer number of people trying to play these games has really pushed the envelope of what they can do in real-time. So they're doing fire, smoke, destruction, um, AI logic, all these sort of things <clears throat> to make these game experiences, and they're doing it in real time. So that can be very useful for a filmmaker because uh, they can leverage a lot of that same stuff. So there's libraries of fire and libraries of smoke and libraries of water. And um, I think Unity has the same thing as Unreal. It's like a, there's basically marketplaces where users can share content. And they'll either share it for free or they'll share it for money. Um, but, you know, if they put together uh, like an AI brain system that can take characters and, and, and just throw them onto a map and have them fight, then that's great. If I have like a battle movie or something, I can just buy this thing, throw it in the background, <clears throat> at least, you know, for the previs, if not, it might not make it in the movie because it might not be a high enough. Uh, resolution asset but I can certainly make decisions based on it and if I don't really care what's going on back there I just want people killing each other or fighting or whatever then then it's perfect you know um, you can keep it you can throw it out so there's a lot of sort of off-the-shelf assets that become available because they've been made for games or other people who are doing film type things make them available uh, photogrammetry is a big shared thing so you know I went out and took photos of a, a an awesome looking tree and you can buy that awesome looking tree and I cleaned up the mesh and here it is for you. 
And, and that's kind of an interesting sort of place to be because um, people can share assets. Uh, the, the, you don't have to build all this stuff from scratch. Um, the game industry is pushing the envelope of what you can do, how many pixels you can push all the time. They're in like a, you know, a war, Unity will come out with something, Unreal comes out with something else. And they're all sort of keeping up with each other uh, as much as they can. <clears throat> and we sort of reap the benefits of all that. So if you can get your assets together before you start to shoot virtually, then all you kind of do is throw them into your scene as you need them. You know, I need a car. Oh, here it is. Throw it in there. Uh, making the assets still takes as much time as it used to. So there's no like real time car making thing, or there's starting to be some of those things with AI um, doing some of the heavy lifting. Um, things that used to take humans a lot of time now can be somewhat facilitated by uh, AI. But um, behaviors in engine are, are useful because you can just throw, you know, rules on something and then throw that something in your scene and it will behave correctly. So, you know, like if I was shooting in the Grand Theft Auto world, I wouldn't have to worry about the traffic patterns or the background people. They would all just be sort of going about their business and I could focus on my shots and telling my story and not like paying all those extras $75 because we missed meal penalty or whatever it is that, you know, you'd have to do in a traditional film. And, and again, the set can come to you. So if you have the ability to digitize a real environment, so it will play back in real time, then I can go there whenever I want. Uh, you can go there whenever you want. We can play like a multiplayer game, but you're the camera guy and I'm the actor, you know, and that's sort of how Hollywood has started to use these game engines. Um, it's, it's like a multiplayer game, but instead of everybody shooting and killing each other or dancing or whatever they do in Fortnite, um, we're telling stories. You know, I'm the gaffer, you're the, the set decorator. And I've, especially during COVID, it's be become very handy to be able to go into these game engines in a multiplayer way, but you're making creative decisions on a film project or something that needs you to have a shared experience. Well, we can do it in the computer now. So it's taken, <clears throat> it's taken the industry a long time to transform what the green screen was 50 odd years ago uh, to if you fast forward it right to this year where you know there's limited obviously um, production but um, you know that you've got Netflix leading the running um, I think in regards to the number of releases because I believe they work so far in advance and they've got a global multiple projects going in different countries and it's a lot of episodic stuff let's face it outside of a hundred million dollar movie right outside of the, the larger projects that they do have I mean, where do you see the movie distribution uh, going as well? Because, you know, being the chapter president, you must talk about that a lot um, with, your, with the teams of people that you work with. Um, it's interesting <clears throat> because there is, I mean, because of the whole COVID thing, people are really trying to reinvent the way they work. Uh, you know, you might not be able to get out of the country you're in. You might not be able to get into the country you want to be in. Um, so how do you keep working? Uh, and you have to figure ways around that. And um, the interesting thing is that you said before, you know, it'll, it'll take less people and it'll cost less money. And some of that's true, but sometimes you just move the money from one place to another and then there's the efficiencies you gain. So you save money more in the efficiencies, but we're moving essentially the post-production process to before you start. So yeah. you still have a bunch of work to do, but once it's done, it's all real time. You know, you hit play. And so that's a little deceptive to, <clears throat> to people. But I think we're still, even though this it seems like we've been at it for a while, we're still discovering things every day about how to work virtually. You know, what does that mean to you? It might mean something different to your production than it means to my production. Um, and then there's also things that are, you know, very grounded in the film industry right now, like, you know, how do I get my tax breaks from working in Atlanta or Vancouver or London nice. or New Zealand or wherever, yeah. if I don't need to do that anymore. So now I'm going to artificially probably 
spread my shoot around. I mean, they're doing that already. It was a practical film unit and they would troop them around all these places to get their, their tax breaks. <clears throat> you're still gonna wanna probably do that even though you're virtual. So the question is what, what is happening in all those different places? You know, is it a green screen of you in London and a green screen of me of Vancouver and a green screen of someone else from Georgia and we get three times the tax, is there more tax breaks there to be had? Is there less tax breaks? So it's it's still something people are trying to figure out, um, but I think the long and the short of it is just because we've come up with this new paradigm doesn't mean people want to completely abandon the old paradigm. Mm -hmm. They just want to work the way they've always worked, but do it digitally. So we're trying to figure out where that merging is. You know, how much of it do you still need to do practically? How much can you do virtually? How much do you have to shoot the same way, even though you don't have to anymore? You know, because they like that. Like, I, you don't have to have get a dolly pusher to push a dolly with markers on it. But the film people are very comfortable with that process. So they would prefer that you do that. You know, whereas the computer people are like, I could just have a joystick. <laughs> so it's, it's sort of like trying to figure out how this works for the individual project. And that's still kind of in flux, I think. I mean, it's an interesting... What about... Uh, yeah. field it's always evolving yeah. yeah what about monetizing the gaming engine assets um let's talk about what happened to pokemon a few years ago uh, which really started a rage in ar consumer behavior right that particular game do you see that um the assets you create in virtual production and, and we can touch on volumetry capture here for a moment as well um, and you, if you can explain what that is uh, in your terms as well, but how the movie business, you know, can take advantage of this moment and actually monetize um, games, right? The music industry is certainly doing it because they've got no choice. There is no live concerts. So they're going right. into virtual, uh, virtually virtual production, right? <laughs> yeah, virtual concerts are definitely a thing. I've been to a few of them. Um, it's interesting, the thing is, if you can get your sort of ducks in a row enough to be able to model something that you might wanna keep, you can keep reusing that thing. How many times do you have to model that door? You know, I've got, a, I've got doors in my house. I only need to model it once. I can change the texture out. I can change the finish of the door out. So the virtual sort of back lot becomes a very real thing, which is what the Unity and Unreal stores are kind of. You know, they're like a back lot. You can go find extras, you can go find uh, props, you can go find sets. Uh, so, so that's sort of a, a democratized version of that. But, but the average filmmaker will be able to put stuff, instead of it all just being disposable, you know, I shot a movie, I had a bunch of sets, we tore them all down, we threw them in dumpsters, I didn't want to store them somewhere. These are digital assets. So provided that you can put them somewhere in the cloud, you could reuse that door in every single movie you ever have a door in if you needed doors that size and shape. So these things are, are malleable, um, especially if you've gone to the nth degree of making it so it's photo real, then, you know, why do that uh, every time from scratch? You don't need to. So unless there's a stylistic choice that, yeah. you know, your door looks nothing like any door that's ever been made before, well, come on down to Door World. We got 400,000 doors from all the other movies that we shot. Yeah. So reuse of these assets can be um, a, a thing, but also extracting things from games is also a thing. You know, so uh, you take a game like Red Dead Redemption. Like, I would love to shoot my back lot in that world. It's so gorgeous. The weather mm -hmm. system is amazing. I mean, they spend at least comparable money you know it's like they say it's like something like a million dollars a minute to do a feature film in hollywood it's it's about the same to do a video game but the video games have many 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 more minutes in them you know like hundreds of hours of content so once you've made that world you know with all the ai of what is a storm you know is lightning dangerous you know if you're under a tree like all these rules about weather why not reuse that in as many places as you can? And you see the video game people doing that. They'll have the same engine for many iterations of a game. Um, but, but you don't see the filmmakers doing that as much, but now they can. So that will start to be a thing if it isn't already. You know, certain companies 
for sure have little digital back lots, but yeah. that kind of thing is just going to explode. And you were asking about volumetric capture. So because these things are so expensive to model, it still takes people if they're not using AI to do the heavy lifting, it still takes somebody to go photograph that tree or that door enough ways that you can represent it in the computer and get the textures off it and the roughness and how shiny it is. So there's a lot of work that can go into making something. Uh, volumetric capture is, is uh, a way of taking photographs of something from many angles and then asking the computer to analyze all those different views and to build a 3D model of that thing. And then because you built it from photos, you can literally project the photos back onto the thing. So it started out from photos, it ends up looking more photo real than it would have if you just modeled it by hand because the photos have the correct scale in them or they have a scale in them. Sometimes you have to define what that scale is. But there's texture, there's lighting, there's shape. There's all the little imperfections that we were talking about earlier are sort of there naturally because that thing was imperfect. So by photographing the imperfections, you can kind of extract that and put that in your model. And you can do it fairly quickly. Uh, so if I had to look at a tree and model a tree from scratch, I'd be there for a long time. But if I can go out and just photograph a tree and then I hit go and it's, you know, 20 hours of compute time on the back end where it crunches all the numbers, gives me back a tree, I'm in a better spot. I can do things faster and more accurately. So you're starting to see people do that a lot now. They've got uh, drones that can do it. Uh, I've seen guys riding around on those segways and they're literally holding LIDAR and segwaying around uh, like as fast as they can go. Uh, LIDAR is starting to get cheaper and faster and you can get more than one frame of it. So LIDAR is a, like a laser range finding uh, technology that basically sweeps an environment with a, a stripe of laser light and can find all the points the light bounces off of and tell you how far away they are. So you get essentially this giant point cloud that looks just like the room you're in. Typically, that used to take hours, hours and hours and hours. Like when we'd have it on a film set, you'd wait until the film had wrapped and the, this poor LIDAR crew would come back at night and they'd be there all night long LIDARing and trying not to get anybody to walk on the set because you'd ruin the LIDAR. Now you can click a button on something and it'll do the whole room in like three minutes, six minutes, sometimes frames per second, which is amazing. You know, 60 frame a second LIDAR is, blows my mind. But uh, if you can do that, you, you're farther along. You know, you, you, yeah. you have the ability to record something straight into the computer and then make decisions on it. Do I even want a, that door? Uh, it doesn't really look good in my set, but I wouldn't have known that till I modeled it. So <clears throat> volumetric capture enables you to sort of extract things from the real world, put it in the computer, and have it represented pretty faithfully in the computer, sometimes like mind-numbingly faithful. I was watching this one thing. It was, uh, I called it the digital backlot. Somebody had just flown a drone like down a street in, I guess, New York or somewhere. But it was all perfect. Like all the graffiti was there and all the stucco that was falling off the buildings and the cracked things and all the little, the dirty parts that are really hard to get right in CG, which is, you just got it for free. So it's amazing. You know, and that thing, once you've recorded it, is like that forever until you change it. So there's no weather. You know, you could be there, I could be there. We don't have to be there at the same time in the same place, but we're both standing in the same environment. It's, it's really cool. It really is like the holodeck. It's amazing. Not to have it's to travel. Sense. Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? The, what about <laughs> um, mixed reality and expanded reality and using the new smart glasses to, you know, make decisions in the future? Um, I mean, we, we don't know a lot about the Apple uh, product coming out, but, you know, there's current models you, you would have looked at, no doubt. Um, what's your thoughts on the, the future of smart glasses for a consumer product, but also for business in, in the film world? I mean, a lot of that is form factor. You know, you got to look stylish or you're not going to want to do it. Um, it's got to have a good field of view or you're not going to want to do it. So there's a lot of gotchas to that and it's still very early days like like virtual production is still in its infancy but like AR XR glasses and, and that is is like really really in its infancy. 
So <clears throat> it's hard to know what Apple's coming out with, but I know that the move is more and more towards smaller, lighter, higher resolution. And then the other thing is not only are they <clears throat> displaying things to you, but they're recording your environment so that they can overlay things in that environment. So if I strap cameras to every human in the world's head and they're digitizing the environment around them, I've got this amazing volumetric capture. All I have to do is stitch together all that yeah. data and, you know, Google Maps on steroids. You know, you wouldn't have like my version of the city. You would have the city. Yeah. I don't know. Have you, have you gone into Google Maps VR lately? Uh, 360, but not that's about it. <laughs> It's amazing. If you go in a Google Maps VR, you can literally choose anywhere in the world. The globe spins just like Google Maps would, but you're, you're like flying like Superman. It's like you're Neo or something flying through the city. And you just go down to the earth and then you're in like Tokyo and it models itself. It's all volumetrically captured from satellites, from the cars that they drive around. So when you see Google Street View, yeah. that's the 2D plate that they then turned into this 3D model and some of the models were well, well, really yeah. detailed. It's amazing. And you just sort of pull yourself around Paris, you know, like <laughs> looking at stuff. And it's it's incredible the detail they're able to get from satellites. It's uh yeah, it's definitely a changed world. And look, tell us a little bit more about the um the society and the opportunities for new members as well. And you know, how many people are involved in in that um well the motion capture society right now um depends where you count our membership i would say we're somewhere in the between seven and ten thousand members if you added up the linkedin and the facebook uh group um so we have the motion capture society facebook group uh, the linkedin group and we also have a new group which is the virtual production group I haven't started calling it society yet, but uh, virtual production on Facebook and LinkedIn. Um, we sort of formed officially in 2007, and um, it's a honorary nonprofit society that uh, tries to foster innovation amongst its members, answer questions, sort of help people through the darkness when they're, you know, going off and trying this for the first time. Um, it's the community, so we all sort of try and help each other figure out problems, you know, so there's a lot of uh, stirring debate about Genlock and, you know, the new card of, from NVIDIA or whatever it is that's the new hotness that people are debating. Um, someone will bring it up, usually someone will give you an answer. So it's um, a very handy uh, user group. Uh, it's also where I collect all the news that's fit to print about things that are related to virtual production or motion capture. So I put all the motion capture stuff on the motion capture page. I put all the virtual production stuff on the virtual production page. Um, and uh, we post a lot of jobs. So we try and help people get work if we hear about them, uh, the jobs being available. And there is a link on both pages that you can click that refreshes hourly. So if you're looking for work and you know COVID is a time when people are working, looking for work, there's a thing called Let's Go Work in Visual Effects, and you can click on that, and it updates every hour, scrapes the entire internet, tells you what kind of jobs are available. And it sort of grew out of a, a secret uh, user group. So there used to be like 10 motion capture supervisors that all knew each other and would chat back and forth and help each other solve little problems or find jobs or whatever. Yeah. And uh, we just thought that we should formalize that process. And so that, that became the Motion Capture Society. Well, I should give a shout out for the, the Hollywood Creative Academy who's launching next month because I'm, I'm certain that uh, we'd like to be a, a member of that as well and uh, encourage people. So what's the, what's the main URL for new members? Um, well, we, we just mostly have people go to Facebook or LinkedIn. Facebook. Okay. So it's a Facebook group. It's a LinkedIn group. We used to have, I mean, we still have a website, but uh, we got attacked by a lot of really good bots that would just flood the, and they're really amazing. I mean, these bots can fill out uh, all sorts of forms that you wouldn't think robots could fill out. 
Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, it was just easier to use uh, Facebook and LinkedIn. That's the primary portal now. And just to finish off, what's, what's your wish for the future for the film business in, in the coming five years? I mean, what, how do you see it changing? Or the, what, what the, is the direction since you're in virtual production, you know, what is your dream for that? Well, I just hope that everybody starts to work virtually. Um, I think virtual production, like I said, it's sort of a catchphrase uh, that, that is a bunch of different things. And it doesn't just mean the final pixels that you see yeah. on screen. So I'm hoping that, you know, movies that are not going to be digital, that uh, will not have CG in them, will be using virtual production to plan their movie right up until the moment when it is no longer in the computer. So, you know, uh, green lighting, so I'd like to see Hollywood green lighting scripts using virtual production and people figuring out which location to go shoot on with virtual production and figuring out where craft services is gonna be with virtual production. So all these things that you do in an analog way, I hope more and more people start to do them virtually because now you can. And so it's like the word processor for filmmaking, you know, and I just hope more people start adopting it because it, it is the future, uh, both of how you'll get final pixels and how you'll plan your shoot all the way through. Excellent. Hey, look, congratulations on your career and, and really you're one of the champions for virtual production, you know, in the last 25 years. So it's been a pleasure to talk to you and, and to hear your vision in the different areas, you know, focus. So um, thanks very much, uh, D-Man, um, president of the Motion Capture Society. Um, just to give that another plug and look forward to speaking again. Thanks very much. All right. Thanks for having me and uh, see everybody on Facebook or LinkedIn. <laughs>